All right, welcome again, everybody. Today's Community Hours is a researcher spotlight with Andrew Blair. We are so excited to invite you today to this Community Hours session. So for those of you who are just joining, there is still a poll running, so feel free to answer that if you haven't yet. Otherwise, we're just going to go through a few housekeeping items, and then we'll turn it over to Andrew. So as we like to do with every session for our community hours or when we have these meetings, we do have a statement of conduct that we like to make sure everybody's aware of. So the Vital Data Catalyst Consortium is dedicated to providing a harassment-free experience for everyone, regardless of gender, gender identity, and expression, in addition to age, sexual orientation, disability, physical appearance, body size, race, or religion, or lack thereof. We do not tolerate harassment of community members in any form, and sexual language and imagery is generally not appropriate for any venue, including meetings, presentations, or discussions. There is a link in the slides that you'll be able to look at later if you are interested in looking at this again. Otherwise, for our agenda today, you're welcome to follow along. There's a link in the corner with the slides. But we're going to go through this housekeeping that I mentioned. And then for the topics for today's community hours, we're going to just have a brief overview of what Biodata Catalyst is, since we have a number of new people today joining. There's also going to be Andrew, who is going to be speaking on his experience with multi-omic data modeling for congenital heart disease and his experience as a bench to bassinet fellow. And then Dave Roberson is going to be talking from Velsera about democratizing app development with BDC, which will link closely with Andrew's research. They've been working very closely together. If you have any questions or need to discuss anything while we're joining together today, feel free to use chat, raise your hand uh, virtually, of course, or come off of audio at any time. We just ask that you wait for a moment when there is a pause to do so. And then we will be happy to address anything that you need. Otherwise, uh, let's go ahead and keep moving forward. So we do have a series of hosts today for our event. I'm gonna just briefly introduce myself and then I'll turn it over to each person listed. So as you can see on screen, my name is Kalina Narwani. I am a user engagement specialist with BDC's coordinating center and happy to help answer questions or things that you have come up throughout this session, or if you have questions and things beyond. Uh, go ahead, Amber. Thanks, Kalina, for the introduction. My name is Amber Vogt. I'm also a user engagement specialist with the Biodata Catalyst Coordinating Center. Happy to see some uh, everybody here today, some faces new, some we've seen in the past, um, but happy to see everybody. I will be monitoring chat and the raise your hand function, so don't be shy about asking questions. We're here to support you, and I will hand it over to Andrew. Hi, my name is Andrew Blair. I am a second year biomedical informatics graduate student at UCSF in the Donavaki Tubes Lab. And today I'll be reviewing um, our uh, congenital heart disease, massively parallel reporter assay design, some of the leading questions uh, for how we design the assay, as well as um, some of the additional uh, analyses that will be, um, and applications that we'll be cr creating as an open source application on the Biodata Catalyst. All right, I'll pass it to Emily. Thanks, Andrew. Hi, everyone. My name is Emily Hughes. <clears throat> um, I am a bioinformatics systems analyst at Harvard Medical School with Paul Aviox Lab. And so specifically, I work on the BDC Powered by Picture platform. And this is a search and cohort building tool that you can use to um, filter on variables and export your data for, for analysis. So excited to be here and provide support or answer any questions. All right, David. Hi, everyone. My name is David Robertson. I'm a community engagement manager for Body of College Powered by Seven Bridges. And I'll be talking about uh, democratizing um, development of analysis workflows going after uh, Andrew. Happy to be here. Yes, thank you, everybody, for your introductions. And just to recap about our session materials today. So Amber was gracious enough to post the link to the slides in chat already for those that are able to view it. 
And then in addition to that, it will still remain available on the community forum, which is the link that Amber shared. We do encourage you to submit any unanswered questions, no matter how big or small, to our help desk as well. And then we also encourage you to join our ecosystem for Biodata Catalyst if you have not already done so. And again, the link for the slides will be shown periodically throughout too, just in case you miss it. Okay, can you can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, again, just a quick uh, reminder, my name is Andrew Blair and I am a graduate student at UCSF. Um, I, uh, my family has a history of congenital heart disease. And so uh, there was an opportunity to uh, uh, design a massively parallel reporter assay with a consortium called uh, the impact of genomic variation on function in the uh, AHI2 lab. And so today I'll be reviewing, um, again, some of the leading questions uh, for uh, the design of this uh, test uh, cardiac MPRA, investigating congenital heart disease, uh, as well as some of the open source applications that we're developing to uh, help uniformly process uh, uh, these data sets. All right, so for a disease background, 60% uh, of CHD cases have an unknown cause, uh, nearly uh, 90% of all phenotype-associated single nucleotide polymorphisms identified by GWAS uh, lied within non-coding regions. And so uh, genome-wide association have implicated common non-coding variants in congenital heart uh, disease, for example, for atrial septal defects and left ventricular outflow tract obstructive lesions. And so um, to investigate um, these non-coding variants, the a study data set generated by the Pediatric Cardiac Genomics Consortium, or PCGC for short, uh, identified patients or a trio proband uh, with patients with structural CHD um, and their parents. So there were 763 tri trios that were en enrolled in this um, uh, program. And the controls were comprised of, um, a, of 16, about 1,600 um, autism unaffected sibling parent trios, and this is from an autism quartet study. And so uh, this analysis was, is, was one of the first um, uh, research articles that I reviewed in Benoit Bruneau's lab when I was a computational research associate, and it was just a really inspiring uh, research article in terms of all of the work that went into identifying de novo variants and then uh, uh, integrating in multiple uh, you know, multi-omic assays like the H3K27 acetylation here for prioritizing enhancers, as well as uh, building these neural networks for uh, uh, annotating these regions, as well as measuring the effect of the variant on, on uh, transcription. So um, this was, again, kind of the, the, the leading article that, that inspired me to come back and, and do my PhD and investigate congenital heart disease. Um, but there are some limitations to deciphering non-coding non -coding variant mechanisms in, in CHD. And one is just a lack of understanding the molecular consequences of non-coding variants. And uh, there's also limited annotation in the delineation of these regulatory elements. And then finally, uh, these non-coding variant effects might be cell type specific and are associated with distinct developmental time points or transient cell states. And so this you know, given these limitations, it, it, you know, it leads to this question, well, how do we measure the level of activity for non-coding regulatory sequences and variants that are associated with congenital heart disease, given that regulatory sequence sites are important for transcription? And when we look at this, uh, this little cartoon diagram here, we can see that we have a promoter region interacting with an enhancer. We have this remodeling complex uh, guided by transcription factors that are helping facilitate the expression of this, uh, this gene here. And so um, when there are, are SNPs or variants within these promoter and enhance, enhancer regions, uh, it, uh, we want to be able to evaluate how these variants impact the expression of these genes. And so uh, the goal for, for my research is to investigate if there is an enrichment in regulatory element categories among CHD de novo variants. And the functional assay that uh, we'll be uh, discussing today and, and employing for, for investigating this question is a, called Massively Parallel Reporter Assay. And so what is a uh, Massively Parallel Reporter Assay? Well, it's a, an assay that can functionally validate thousands of regulatory elements simultaneously using high throughput sequencing and barcode technology. 
So uh, it starts uh, first by identifying uh, candidate regulatory sequences. And so these are traditionally identified using some chromatin state uh, model, like a hit and Markov model, for instance, uh, or uh, guided by other omic uh, modalities like TAC-seq and CHIP-seq and looking at different combinatorics of accessible chromatin and histone CHIP-seq marks. Um, and then also we have um, a minimal promoter that drives the expression of a reporter gene, so in this case, luciferase. Um, and then finally, we have um, uh, our candidate regulatory sequence that has a unique molecular identifier so that we can uh, identify the uh, transcription of these CR CRSs and um, link them to, a, again, a barcode. Once uh, we design and select our candidate regulatory sequences, we need to have a delivery method. And so there are a couple different um, methods for that. There's uh, Lenti NPRA. This is a, a, a experimental technique that Nadav's lab pioneers. And then there's also adenovirus. And within this, there are different uh, transfection modes of integration. So episomal versus chromosomal. And then once you can get those, uh, those experimental parameters defined, uh, you uh, do a RNA DNA extraction from the cell sequence, and then you quantify the activity score. So this is just a ratio of the RNA and DNA. And so um, the question that, that started when designing this first assay, and I'll open this question just kind of broadly to the, to the community right now, is like, what functional genomic assays and methods slash models would you use to select candidate regulatory sequences that harbor CHD variants? So I'll give it a couple couple seconds for people to think about it, and feel free to post it in the chat or um, raise your hand or or go ahead and turn off your mic. Okay, going once, going twice. Okay, let's keep going. So uh, to identify different types of genomic states or chromatin states, uh, typically, typically we look at different um, omics modalities. So for instance, identifying chromatin accessibility, we employ an assay called the TAC-seq. And we can see that when we look at chromatin accessibility with other uh, omics modalities like DNA methylation or these histone marks, we can see that there are different distributions within, um, uh, within, within the cell. Uh, specifically, we see, like, for instance, uh, bimodal distribution um, along the chromatin accessibility, the chromatin accessibility mark to identify active promoters, and similarly with um, enhancer poised or primed regions. And so we use a combination of um, attack and chip seq and RNA seq to select um, these regulatory elements that we want to measure um, the activity of the sequence itself using MPRA. And so um, when we want to uh, think about how do we then design this assay such that we can ask questions where we can see, for instance, an enrichment of, um, of CHD variants within a specific regulatory annotation, like active promoters or poised slash prime enhancers, we want to be able to have um, some background guiding library data set so that we can develop a testable hypothesis to say that, for instance, if a CHD variant uh, is harbored within active promoter or uh, an enhancer region, that we are able to say that it has an activity score greater than some background control set, whether that's a positive or, or negative control set. We want to be able to design that testable hypothesis. So that leads us to thinking about an enrichment analysis of cardiac regulatory elements. And so uh, we want to be able to associate cardiac gene sets or pathways with a background set. And once we define these background sets, then we can start to develop a null hypothesis and test statistic, whether that's a bootstrap or permutation test. And some of the software that I use for that is Region R Annotator and Annotation Hub. Uh, although Mike Love's lab has uh, null ranges and bootstraps, which is a much more uh, heavy duty uh, version of these software tools. So. Anyway, so for example, uh, one enrichment analysis might be, um, is the cardiac ventricular development pathway uh, significantly associated with congenital heart disease de novo variants? And so uh, first, you'd want to do a background screen of this GO pathway. So there are 536 regions that are associated with uh, this pathway. 
Uh, and that's um, intersecting with your background set. So now we'll want to define a null hypothesis uh, to, to evaluate. So in this case, our null is to uh, gene ontology, this ventricular septal development associated region, um, and CHD de novo variants overlap the same amount as what would be expected between our de novo variants and random regions. And so we, you know, depending on your null hypothesis, you can develop a test statistic, in this case, a, a permutation test to evaluate uh, whether there is a significant association between this gene set pathway and your um, de novo variant gene list. But again, you still need to have some background data set to be able to select and identify where these regions are um, in your experimental model. And so uh, to define that background uh, data set, I use the Cardiovascular Development Consortium or the CVDC version one data for selecting candidate regulatory elements. And so uh, quick background on this data set, we had an experiment. So this is an experimental in vitro data set in H9 IP iPSC cells. And there's a differentiation between day zero and day 80, where at each time point, we had two biological replicates per time point in assay. So again, day zero, we had all four of these uh, 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 genomic assay modalities and two biological replicates. Uh, and we were using uh, the, the human embryonic stem cell set, which comprised roughly 96 data sets uh, to develop our this testable hypothesis where we're wanting to um, really just defined our, our test region background set so that we can start to uh, uh, develop a, a, a null hypothesis evaluating if there's an enrichment of CHD variants in regions that are associated with a specific developmental process or disease process in, um, in cardiovascular development. So uh, this is a, a high overview, a look at our MPRA test design for investigating the activity of sequences and variants associated with CHD. So to begin, I did a literature scrub on uh, congenital heart disease and cardiometabolic associated genes. Um, and I used our uh, CVDC version one background data set uh, to identify um, uh, these genes that, have, um, that are expressed within the RNA-seq, and then I used the HI-C data set to identify their topologically associated domains. So uh, to do that, I took the lower bound of the start of the TAD boundary and the upper bound of the end of the TAD. Um, so that defined the regulatory domain for each of our, our target genes, and then we uh, developed a selection ranking strategy, or in this, or in this case, uh, chromatin state. So we looked at different combinatorics of attack in 27 acetylation and H3K4 trimethylation to identify, for instance, candidate promoters and candidate enhancers. So, you know, for instance, we have this CHD slash uh, metabolic associated gene, um, and we're uh, selecting all candidate promoters and enhancers that are within some linear distance of that of that target gene, and uh, intersect with other targets of interest. And what I mean by that are just some uh, a priori background data set that intersects with these regions. So for instance, the CHD database or uh, the Idaker and Chi Labs uh, CHD and Autism Convergent Molecular Network. We, so we intersected with oh, also the Vista Heart Enhancer. So lots of a priori information went into um, intersecting these uh, candidate promoters and enhancers. And after we went through the selection ranking, um, Anything that was left over, we just included within uh, the library. Um, and to uh, evaluate if uh, any of the high C contacts, so for instance, here we, we see um, a candidate promoter and a candidate enhancer that are in contact, identified again by the high C. Um, and, and here we see that the enhancer and the promoter are in contact, and this promoter is also in contact with uh, the protein coding region of this uh, of our target gene of interest, uh, we want to be able to backtrace and evaluate if any of these high C contacts have uh, are, are in are in indicative of differential activity within our MPRA assay. So, um, and this is important for for uh, for temporal modeling, but in this case, we focus just on a small window. Um, primarily the, the cardiac mesoderm uh, cells, cardiac progenitors, and primitive cardiomyocytes. And uh, the reason for this was we wanted we want to be able to define 
uh, test regions that have high activity in progenitor and primitive cardiomyocytes that can be used um, in much larger MPRE screens that uh, are evaluating an allelic series of, of CHD. So, um, you know, when we're thinking about designing an allelic series uh, or, or an MPRE evaluating an allelic series for CHD, we, we, we want to consider how we're designing our oligos for, for an MPRA. And so for this for this test uh, MPRA, which again is just to define um, regions that have high activity at the progenitor and primitive cardiomyocyte stage, uh, we wanted to uh, be able to ask where is, when we center the oligo um, to test in the MPRA, uh, does, the, does the placement of the oligo have a, 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 a diff different activity level when we're centered on the variant, or in this case, the summit. So what is a summit? That's just the where the uh, number of reads uh, uh, pile up at uh, either an accessible chromatin region from attack or histone chip seek mark. So we've got, in this case, for our, our, our enhancer region, we just centered at the attack seek summit. And for our promoter regions, we had two different tiling strategies, um, and we were there were some experimental limitations to this design. So, for for instance, we're only able to um, evaluate 270 base pair, and so for uh, promoter regions where the summit was um, uh, closer to 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 the to the start of where the um, regulatory element began, uh, we just did standard tiling. So we started where we first saw the signal, and then we. Uh, started to tile over with a 90 base pair overlap. And the uh, idea for that is that if there's any transcription factor uh, binding sites, uh, we wouldn't be missing that with that 90 base pair overlap. But if we saw that the summit um, was uh, in the middle and we had some conditionals here where if the location is greater than or equal to 350 base pairs from the start or end of the regulatory element, then we would just center there and then tile outwards. And so uh, again, the idea here is that we want to be able to measure when we do develop the allelic series, where do we place the oligo with respect to the variant? Do we center the oligo on where the variant is at, or do we do it closer to where it's the variant is at the beginning of the oligo? And so in this uh, preliminary test MPRA, uh, we're wanting to develop um, some, some in silico models so that we can identify where we are uh, placing those tiles. And that's in uh, collaboration with, um, again, the IGVF consortium with um, Anshul Kandaji's lab. So, um, you know, I've talked a little bit about positive controls, but I didn't, I haven't mentioned negative controls yet. So um, when we are evaluating if there is a, a differential activity in, uh, in an allelic series, we want to be able to say that, um, for instance, the alternative uh, uh, sequence has lower or greater activity than um, the, the reference. Here we're wanting to, um, uh, to define our negative control background set. We, we want to be able to uh, uh, select regions that, and, and design them in a way where uh, they should have no regulatory activity or no activity score in the, in the MPRA assay. And so uh, for these negative controls, uh, we randomly selected 50 sequences from each assay type, and then um, and that include, included the different combinations and overlaps. And then we randomly shuffled, um, uh, we did a dinucleotide shuffling on each of those random sequences that we pulled. And then uh, for the other uh, negative control set, I'm calling this the candidate negative control set, these were regions that were randomly selected from the TAD boundaries. Um, and when we uh, looked at this within the UCSC genome browser, we saw that there was like no signal uh, also within our guiding library data set. And so uh, here we're also evaluating if any of the high C inference models that define the boundaries and the contact regions have um, or, 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 or um, what we're expecting experimentally. So, and again, in summary with that, we want to be able to evaluate if the high C inference models indicate um, a, a differential activity based on the contact scores between promoter and enhancer regions in the target gene. And then um, the second point for this is to evaluate if the, if the boundaries that are identified by high C um, 
are, are really delineating regulatory domains. Okay, so um, in summary, we selected 652 uh, CHD and cardiometabolic-associated pre-targets and within their TADs. Um, we use the high C uh, to identify a lower bound for the start and an upper bound for the end. Um, and we did some thresholding for the RNA-seq. So we made sure that, um, you know, given our literature scrub, that we did see RNA-seq signals uh, within our guiding library data set. Um, and then we um, uh, prioritized our candidate regulatory elements using uh, uh, combinatorics of attack and chip seek, as well as any intersections of our target of interest. And for our negative controls, we took um, <clears throat> again uh, all of the different combinatorics of our attack and chip seek uh, to um, and did dynamically attached shuffling. So that's you know, just a standard procedure for for uh, designing our negative control set. And then for our candidate negative control set, we uh, randomly selected sequences from our high C uh, identified tad boundaries. Um, so the idea here is that the attack and chip seek, these are low resolution assays that just kind of give you an, a, an identification of where in the genome you see accessible chromatin and these histone marks, but you're not getting um, uh, like a quantitative signal of the sequence itself. And so here, um, you know, what, what I'd love to build up to is to, to start to uh, think about building a, 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 a multi-omic molecular network where we're able to define um, the or, or, or layer over the activity scores of, of the sequences for, identified from MPRA and, and use MPRA to guide a CRISPR eye screen. And so um, I like to think about all of this in the context of a network. So um, here is just an, an overall design of a, a proposal to construct a multi-omic enrichment network. So you go on the genome browser, you see all of the tracks. Um, you got your enhancers, promoters, your target genes. I, I like to think about collapsing all of this within a network. Um, and here, are the color gradients just correspond to enhancer, or promoter, and then our, our, our protein coding region. So uh, the idea is that you know, TAC and ChIP-seq, this can identify our enhancers and promoters, but it doesn't give you um, like a like a, an empirical signal of, of the activity of the sequences. And so that's where the MPRA assay comes in. And so the color shading within the network here is, is represents the activity level of these sequences. Um, and when we uh, intersect these sequences with, with whole genome sequencing, for instance, we can uh, start to, to be able to develop these enrichment uh, uh, strategies where we're evaluating if an enrichment of a, of a CHD phenotype within a promoter region has an impact on transcription and then identify at what point in time does that variant impact the, the, develop, the developing heart. And so, uh, for instance, uh, you have an enhancer that has high activity at the mesodermal cardiac stage. And we see here with these links here identified by the HI-C that the enhancer has, uh, has strong contact with the promoter. And this promoter uh, region harbors a CHD variant. But at the mesoderm stage, we're not seeing high uh, RNA seq signals, and so when we you know go down the the differentiation uh, into the progenitor cardiomyocyte, we see uh, some some differential activity in the enhancer region and the promoter. So enhancer activity start to go down, promoter goes up, as well as our, our RNA seq, and we also we're also starting to see some differences within the high seq contact, and and at some point we see that. The enhancer is no longer active, but the promoter is active and the um, RNA seq levels are high. And so we might be able to then devise a, 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 a null hypothesis such that we're evaluating if at the progenitor cardiomyocyte stage, the CHD promoter uh, is impacting um, the, di the differentiation of progenitor cardiomyocytes to primitive cardiomyocytes. And we can start to layer on uh, you know, tertiary experiments evaluating using CRISPR-I or maybe uh, CRISPR-A, where if we silence this promoter, is it um, also you know, silencing the transcription of um, our target gene? And is that having a, an impact on um, differentiation from progenitor to primi primitive cardiomyocytes? So um, you know, given you know, the lead up to this, this, this multi-omic enrichment network, um, we, we also want to have some uniform processing of, of our MPRA data. So the Biodata Catalyst has um, already has all of the ENCODE 
attack and chip seek and whole genome sequencing workflows as well as RNA seq. Uh, but we don't have a massively parallel reporter assay um, uh, workflow for for processing each stage. And so. Um, over the last couple of months, uh, Dave has been uh, absolutely phenomenal helping train me to, to get the NPR, our NPRA workflows uh, up on the Biodata Catalyst, as well as some of the ranking models to select these regions. So um, our primary computational wheelhouse for NPRA is, starts with NPRA Snakeflow. Uh, and so what this does is it associates barcodes with sequences. So that's the first part of the the um, of your experiment is looking to see if your barcodes are promiscuous with other candidate regulatory sequences, and then we want to count these barcodes for the DNA and RNA, um, and then uh, we have another tool called NPRA Analyze, and what this does is it takes our sequence pairs into our reference and alternate alleles and does a differential expression of these sequence pair reads. So. Um, uh, you know, in, in the Biodata Catalyst, what we're doing is we're, we're building a push button application for processing work for a processing workflow uh, that we'll make as a, a, an open source application on the BDC. And so what we see here is just an info description panel of what um, this this looks like. So we have some tags here for for um, hopefully people uh, that are searching for uh, the, the workflow, uh, they'll be able to identify it with some of these key terms that, that we float around in some of the other consortium work that is, is supporting this uh, uh, these studies. Um, and so we just have an overview of, of how the workflow is broken down uh, into these two different CWL tools. And these are just a stitching, uh, the assignment and experiment step or a stitching of, of MPRA Snakeflow. And I think Dave might talk a little bit about this as well as um, some of the ranking models. Uh, at the end. So, um, you know, we've, we, we have our processing and then we have our analysis software. And uh, what, what I've been primarily developing over the last couple of months is, is an NPRA database. And the idea here is that we'll have uniformly processed NPRA data sets with a minimal standard operating procedure for our primary, secondary, and tertiary analysis. And um, you know, the, 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 the background for this is that there have already been some prior cardiovascular research studies utilizing MPRAs, and to date, only two cardiac studies have been published uh, using MPRAs, both from uh, Bill Poo's lab. Uh, the first um, uh, is, the first work was done um, identifying genomic regions that were bound by multiple poor cardiac transcription factors, and the library here was a little bit different. So it was a library that evaluated 2,700 regions. Um, and in this case, the regulatory elements that they were able to evaluate were 400 base pairs in length. This was also an in vivo assay. Um, and uh, they had a different way of defining their background uh, positive and negative control set. Um, and then uh, somewhat recently, they had a second cardiac study that expanded on the results of how they selected regulatory elements in this Nature Communications article. Uh, and here they were identifying candidate enhancers that included a subset with atrial or ventricular specific occupancy. So um, I'm going to show just a quick teaser of what the database looks like right now. Um, so uh, what you're seeing is the landing page of the database. Uh, can, ev can everyone see, see this? Do I need to change? Yes, we can see it. Okay, thank you. So um, what I'm showing here is just the landing page of what um, the MPRA database looks like. Here, uh, uh, each uh, row is, a, is an object itself from um, the Nature Communications article um, from Bill Poo's lab. And um, we have different um, column identifiers that, that we can look uh, to help specify, um, for instance, you know, when we, when I share the fully populated database, we'll be able to see different organisms, different library types, uh, the linking the geo and encode IDs, sample names, as well as what annotation model we use. So in this case, I annotated it using the um, a bioconductor TXDB package. Um, and we have other uh, metrics that we're going to be um, integrating into the, this landing page. So um, 
know, just to float another idea. So, so you know, for instance, uh, here uh, we indicate the resource name is the Cardiovascular Development Consortium. This is version the version one data set, I believe. But um, after we we coordinate with with uh, Bill Poo's lab, maybe we can uh, coordinate some uniform processing. Have this as a version one. Um, I indicated myself as the data wrangler, and then Joe uh, Joe Yost, and uh, oh, I should probably also put Bill Poo's name here for. Uh, the CDDRC wrangling into um, uh, their mosaic database. So um, this database platform doesn't is not just you know a meta summary of of the data sets. We can also uh, have some minimal analysis. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm I've launched a default configuration um, uh, software panel of the of the data set. So this is looking at their embryonic stem cell. And I believe this one is for specifically looking at VISTA neural enhancers within uh, their library design. Um, and you see here, each of these panels corresponds to some uh, uh, quote unquote slot within the data set. So for instance, row data is a slot that uh, indicates all of the candidate regulatory elements that were profiled in this MPRA. So uh, this is just a unique identifier for the gene ID and the name, since you have a many to one mapping. Uh, but we have the gene symbol here and the gene ID. And um, this corresponds, so the row data information here corresponds to um, the assay matrix, which has the log ratios of our RNA and DNA. Uh, so that's what is in the assay. And the feature just means that this is this particular feature. So we have DNA uh, average. And we can look at different um, the DNA average or the RNA average, and you know, right now this is not this isn't giving a lot of information, right? So it's just it's just one sample point. But when we um, integrate all of these samples together, we'll be able to have like a violin plot showing uh, all of this uh, uh, the 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 activity uh, score ratios for all of these samples within some with within some uh, region of of interest. So uh, this is an active development. I just wanted to share that little teaser. And then um, you know another reason why we're we're developing this this database is that um, we do see that there uh, that uh, an enhancer loss um, of MYL2 and MYH7 does result in a phenotype that's consistent with heart disease in a mouse. So the Vista Heart Enhancer folks developed this, this catalog of um, using heart epigenome data, uh, namely ChIP-seq, from uh, whole genome sequencing studies, as well as um, uh, mouse studies, to identify regions um, that they could functionally validate or, or explore. So in this case, they uh, identified an enhancer for uh, MYL2, and when they knocked this out, it had um, uh, it, it, it had a phenotype that was of uh, hypertrope big uh, cardiomyopathy and dilated cardiomyopathy. So um, this is just, you know, as a, as a, as a, um, another reason why we want to start developing these databases and standardizing the, the meta attributes so that we can you know, systematically evaluate the loss of function for all of these enhancers given some consensus NPRA model. So you know, we, we really want to start thinking about building a, an object-oriented database for NPRA data because, um, uh, there's just so many varieties of reporter assays in terms of the experimental techniques. So Bill Poo's lab uses the adenovirus in an in vivo system. Uh, our preliminary cardiac MPRA is going to be employed in Lenti MPRA and in an in vitro WTC11 cell line. So there's, you know, different cell types and organisms and experimental techniques. So a lot, a lot of different open-ended utility um, and the domain biology uh, varies from congenital heart disease to cardiometabolic. And, um, and in, ter in terms of the choices in technology, there's different modes of integration, chromosomal, episomal. And so uh, this database is, is really catered towards uh, creating a central reporting and version control platform for sharing MPRA data and analysis. And so uh, here we're just building on established um, uh, uh, ob uh, object designs, uh, namely a, a summarized experiment object to support uh, this uh, systematic and integration of, of N uh, NPRA data sets. And yeah, so again, this is just what the IC NPRA base looks like. So IC stands for Interactive Summarized Experiment Explorer. 
Um, and this is uh, for sharing both the data and the code too. So for instance, uh, what, what we're looking to do is create an open source GitHub community that uh, people can help uh, share, uh, and, uh, whether as a data wrangler or as um, uh, somebody that's interested as an analyst for you know, a secondary or tertiary analysis evaluating transcription factor binding mo uh, motif. So lots of different um, open-ended utility just for the database and, and the reporting that, that we have ideas for. And so this is all leading up to um, a push button solution for MPRA analysis. So we have an open source organization called MPRA Hub for, for our analysis and sharing and different genomics cloud computing infrastructures. The Biodata Catalyst is really what's driving a lot of this. So um, in the IGVF consortium, what we've proposed is to have a configuration file where users defined a list of NGS identifiers to launch the MPRA uh, processing workflow. And so the idea here is that you're just going to drag and drop your files, press execute. And what this will do for, for the analyst is it'll pull from one of our repositories in our open source MPRA hub uh, and, uh, and take that, that pull request and auto-generate a quality control notebook that the analyst will review before um, submitting their object to our, our database, which is hosted on Synapse. And so um, they'll also be able to contribute to the IC MPRA base analysis platform, either uh, their data set or their analysis. And we're showing how to do some of those workspace demos for creating those application plugins just for the IC MPRA base within, within Terra. Um, and the goal here is that we'll be um, trying to semi-automate uh, release of our uh, MPRA uh, genomics index catalog on Anvil um, each quarter. So this is you know, a culmination of what we're, we're trying to lead up to for our MPRA uh, computational uh, wheelhouse. So next steps, uh, we are looking to release uh, the MPRA Snakeflow processing application on the NHLBI Biodata Catalyst soon. We're stress testing that right now. And I think uh, Dave will talk a little bit about um, also like different development strategies of, of how we've used SnakeMake. Um, we'll, we'll also be publishing our open source MPRA database. It consists of roughly 130 data sets right now that have been formatted into a summarized experiment object. Um, and then we'll also be defining what our primary and secondary minimal standard operating procedures are for analyzing MPRA data. So um, just quick acknowledgements. Uh, first, thank you to the Ahi2 lab at UCSF for, for an amazing opportunity to, to learn more about functional genomics and uh, design and MPRA, investigating MPRA, uh, as well as Benoit Bruneau at the Gladstone Institutes for, for uh, his, um, his mentorship and in, in training me and also for the opportunity to, to learn about um, um, uh, the PCGC and Bench to Bassinet program. Um, at UC San Diego to Neil Chi for sharing um, the, the CBDC version one data set and just always being somebody that I feel like I can chat with and get you know real um, real world advice on about just the the, the scope and um, scalability of some of the ideas that we have as well as uh, IGVF and ENCODE for for helping us um, organize and, and work with experts in the field to design the, the experiment and just just statistical parameters for, for designing the MPRA as well as uh, the Biodata Catalyst and the Bench to Bassinet and CDDRC program and all of the computational programs that help get um, get these projects up and running. So, um, uh, so some of the experience uh, that I've had as a B2B fellow and uh, using the Biodata Catalyst is that, um, and just in terms of skill development, um, what I'm learning is that there's not one uh, data sharing and analysis strategy that fits all, that each project has its own, you know, um, special nuances, either in how you analyze it or how you share the data. Um, there's, a lot, well, I, I, there's a lot of research and networking opportunities, uh, our office hours every Thursday that, that we attend. There's other uh, fellows that, that I'm starting to meet um, from, from Top Med as well as the PCGC and CDDRC program. Uh, there's access to resources that I am really excited to begin working with outside of MPRA. And I'm not an epidemiologist, but I'd love to learn how to uh, identify common and rare variants and de novo variants and just explore the VAT ecosystem within the BDC. Uh, it's just really, um, you know, a really great exposure to the cutting edge research tools that uh, the BDC is helping 
support, um, just the, in terms of the accessibility to, to young researchers um, that, I, you know, I, in my opinion, are really going to help um, uh, trainees find career opportunities uh, after their PhD. Um, so advice, ask questions, um, and don't, don't be afraid to ask questions, and um, maybe start with an established data set or model that you can collaborate with the experts to understand and implement. Um, and then, you know, one of the things that, that, that I was really excited about learning at the beginning was like, how do I make one of these workflows and uh, just, you know, taking it slow, uh, being incremental about your development strategy. So start off with a tool before implementing a massive workflow, uh, which is what you kind of have to do anyways. So, all right, I think I'm passing it to Dave now, unless there are any questions, maybe I should wait to see if there are any questions for a couple minutes. Andrew, can I ask a question? Yeah. Really nice work. Um, this is Chani. Uh, I was wondering about kind of the compatibility of the different types of data sets in terms of cross species, like evolutionary conservation, because a lot of these um, crees are going to be identified in people, but obviously might be tested in animal models for pharmaceutical development. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have not. So I haven't done like a fast cons analysis between the IP, like the in vitro human embryonic stem cells with the with the mouse in vivo and in vitro. That's a great question. That's something that definitely should, <laughs> should get done and, and reviewed before, uh, you know, building on the in vitro assay for in, for an in vivo application. Though what, what we did do for, for the first NPRA is we did, we did intersect with we did do intersections with in vivo human and mouse from the Vista Heart Enhancer in the Cotney Lab, uh, but in terms of you know the evolutionary conservation and the activity of those sequences, I, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure what um, I, I we would have to have that as a retrospective analysis um, since For the sure. data has already been um, we're already starting to generate the data. But that's a, yeah, that's a good question. Awesome, really nice work. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions for Andrew? Thank you so much, Andrew. That was a really great presentation and super exciting to, to, to the fact that you're bringing this sort of multi-omics type analysis to, um, to the BDC community. So I just want to quickly in the remaining time, by the way, we might go just one or two minutes over um, drop off if you have to. Um, I want to talk about how we approach democratizing app development on Biodata Catalyst. My name is Dave Robertson. I'm the community engagement manager for Biodata Catalyst powered by Seven Bridges. And I'm really happy that I get to work with um, scientists like Andrew and other fellows. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll go really quickly, but what I want to focus on is the features that help um, researchers develop and test apps on the BDC ecosystem and with a focus on the Seven Bridges platform. Um, and so some of the use cases that we've uh, recently been working on, MPRA Snakeflow uh, that Andrew went through, activity by contact model, which is another um, uh, uh, workflow that uh, Andrew's been working on, and um, a universal R script runner, which I think a lot of people will be pleased to hear about. Um, but all this sort of uh, depends on the community aspect. So I just want to reiterate that we do have office hours. Uh, we do um, can schedule working time with you if there are apps um, that or software that you want to implement on a cloud scale. Um, so really development of these apps is how we can help democratize heart, lung, and blood and sleep research, um, in particular, the stuff that Andrew has been working on. Uh, so um, what were some of the features that Andrew used? Um, he used the tool, and you, he, he showed a screenshot of some of these. He, he used the tool editor to describe the snake make, FPR snake make uh, command line. He used the workflow editor to connect two different parts of the snake make together, and I'll talk about that later. And he also used Data Studio, uh, in particular, Jupyter Lab Terminal, so that the feature inside of the Jupyter Lab environment that allows you to um, run commands, 
the benefit there of doing everything on the platform is if, for instance, if you have controlled data um, or large data that you don't want to have locally or that you may not be allowed to also have locally, you can access that um, through all of these features. Now, some of the software that we use, uh, SnakeMake, we use Conda. We use the CWL tool, which is a, um, an open source executor for uh, CWL um, workflows. And we use a, um, a piece of software called UDocker. So these are kind of new, new things that we're experimenting with. And what they allow us to do is take um, the GitHub project, for example, um, in this case, NPRA Snakeflow, and make it runnable in a graphical interface. Um, this might be kind of small for you to see, but we have um, all the inputs. And there's a, you know, it's pretty complex stuff, but you can sort of break it down and to what, what are the inputs, uh, what are some of the app settings, and then what are the outputs. And um, running things on Biodata Catalyst powered by seven bridges will give you all this great sort of uh, extra information about the time that it took to run. You can click on view stats and logs and, you know, drill down into some, some more details. Um, so for NPRA Snakeflow in particular, we use the tool editor. Uh, we use the workflow editor to stitch together two different parts. And why do we do that? So that's kind of represented and um, Andrew's col colleague, uh, Jing Jing, um, sort of um, had this idea that you have um, one part of the pipeline, the assignment step, uh, which you may want to what, may want to run, but then you may need to repeat the counting or the experiment step several times. And that's shown here on this timeline. And you can easily see that the assignment step only took 20 minutes or so, but we're get, definitely getting, um, uh, we have some opportunity potentially to increase the uh, compute to make the NPRA experiment um, completely faster. This also helps for separation of concerns and maybe uh, troubleshooting that um, may, need, may need to be um, done. And some unique design choices that Andrew and I worked on is not rewriting the software or not rewriting the workflow in common workflow language. It does have sort of like an outer shell, but the main um, engine is SnakeMake, exactly how it was um, in the GitHub repository. And um, so we had some challenges that we're still working through, um, but we'll try to keep the community updated. Something else we did was uh, activity by contact model, which is software that's um, developed by the Broad. We made that a workflow. And something I'm working on with uh, Matthew Goodman, who's a top med fellow. Um, and I think this is gonna be really interesting to a lot of people on the call. If, if you're an R user and you wanna just sort of submit the script as a job to Biodata Catalyst, um, you might just say, here's my script and here's the files that I wanna run the script on. Uh, we, we're coming up with this idea that you could actually um, add almost any R script if it's configured a certain way. Um, and uh, it'll run performantly because it's gonna use the split apply combined data processing method, which we also call scatter again. So um, I just wanna conclude with, if you have any development ideas, um, please stop by either uh, BDC Seven Bridges office hours, which we host Tuesdays at 10 a.m. You, you can also talk to Andrew because he comes to, at least comes to the Thursdays a lot. Um, uh, so it's 10 a.m. on uh, Tuesdays, 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern time on Thursdays. So this link will be in the slides on the forum. Uh, you can send me an email directly or you can post on the BDC forum. So we're really trying to encourage the community to post more in the forum about any questions they may have about how to do a specific analysis or any ideas for new apps they might want to run. Um, uh, or get sort of set up to run, and we can help you with that. Um, and I think that's about it. Uh, I'll send it back to Kalina. Yeah, thank you, Dave and Andrew, for both presenting so well. We really appreciate it. Just a couple quick cleanup things. One, there's a poll running if you're interested in being contacted or have additional questions. Otherwise, there is the help desk, 
which we'll go ahead and post in chat really quick. And then in addition to that, go ahead, Dave, and move forward. You can join the ecosystem that we mentioned at the beginning. The link is here. It'll also be in the slides that you'll get in a follow-up email from this with the materials today. And then lastly, let's go ahead and go to the last one. We want to thank you for joining again today. And you can go ahead and register if you haven't already for the July Community Hours, which will be about linking phenotypic data to genomic data files. And that'll be on July 19th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So thank you again, everybody. Uh, we'll hang around a little bit, I think, in case there's any last minute questions. Otherwise, you're free to go.